Take your Bibles, if you would, and open them to Matthew chapter 16 and find verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. If you didn't bring a Bible with you today, there is one in the pew rack. If you'll take that Bible out of the pew rack and open it to page 822, you'll find Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Find that in your Bible or your phone or your iPad or whatever it is you brought today. Let's look together at at God's Word. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And... In other words, he was trying to take just the popular opinion poll. What, what's, what's the word on the street about who I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And sir, ma'am, that's the most important question you will ever be asked as well. Who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter, being the spokesman for the group, as he often does, speaks up. Simon Peter replied, verse 16 says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Would you ask the Lord to speak to your heart today about who you are? What your responsibility is as a believer? Ask Him to show you truth from this passage. And then you pray for me that I can deliver this clearly as he's laid it on my heart. So right now, pray for yourself and pray for me. Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to share now your word. And I do pray... For myself. Father, I ask that just the words that I say would be your words, words of truth, and I would say them clearly, Father, in a way that could be understood by every person here. And I pray for those who listen, Father, that they wouldn't just hear my voice, Father, but they would hear your voice. And today, whatever their point of need is, you would meet them there as your word is taught and preached. And Father, we just give. Give this to you now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Possessions of the wealthy can be extremely valuable. The powerful, the famous people, no matter how common those items must be or can be, they're often sold for a very high price. I read this week that Napoleon's toothbrush sold for $21,000. Now, can you imagine paying that much money for a used toothbrush when Dr. Hufstetter will give you one free? (laughs) Hitler's car sold for $150,000. At a Sotheby's auction... Of some of the Kennedy's possessions, Jackie Kennedy's fake pearls, fake pearls, sold for $211,500. And at that same auction, JFK's golf clubs went for $772,500. You spend all that money and the whole object is to use those clubs the least amount of times possible. 
None of those items are worth that much. Obviously, none of those items are worth that much, but they sold for that much. Why? They sold for that much because they belong to somebody significant. Now, buckle your pew belt. Are you ready for this? We fit that bill too. We are owned by God. We are created in His image. We are children of the King. Think of the value of something owned by God. What incredible worth that bestows upon you and me. What inexplicable dignity we have because we are called in Scripture a people for God's own possession. We belong to Him. I want to begin our life point this morning this way. Our life point, that is that point where your life and Scripture intersect. I want to begin this morning by saying those words that are now on the screen. I am a stone fixed on Jesus. You are a valuable, precious, unique, priceless stone fixed on Jesus. Now I want to show you that. I want to explain that to you, and I want to begin in verse 18 by focusing on Jesus' words to Peter in verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. That's how valuable you are. Upon this rock I will build my church. But listen to me. There are four different ways to interpret those words. That's not an easy passage of Scripture to understand. Down through the years, the church has given four very different interpretations to these words of Jesus. Four significantly different interpretations of these words from Jesus. Let me walk you through them. The first interpretation is that the rock is Peter. On this rock... I will build my church. The rock is Peter. That is the position of the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was built on the person of Peter, who became the first pope and the bishop of Rome. And there has been an apostolic succession of popes ever since. Linus is considered the second pope. He ruled from 67 to 76 A.D. The word pope just means father. It comes from the Greek word papas, pope. The pope is considered to be the supreme and authoritative representative of Christ on earth. And if you notice down below, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. That is the power to absolve and not to absolve. The power to absolve or not to absolve a man from his sins. The rock is Peter. It's position number one. Position number two. The rock is Peter and the other apostles. And this is the position of William Barclay and several New Testament scholars. Jesus is saying, yes, Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. But not in the sense that the Catholic Church would believe. Jesus is speaking to Peter, but also through Peter to the other apostles there that day. Those other apostles standing there that day will be the stones on which the church will be built because they are the first ones who will believe. They are the first ones who will have faith in Jesus. They are the ones who will confess, as Peter did, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the whole church will be built on these men. Peter and the other apostles. In fact, Ephesians 19 and 20 says, You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The rock is Peter and the apostles. Interpretation number three. The rock is the confession that Peter has just made. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is the confession. This is the position of Martin Luther. 
who said, All who agree with the confession of Peter are Peter's themselves setting a sure foundation. In other words, Jesus will build his church on and with people who make the same confession as Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, I'll build my church on people and with people who make that same confession. If and when you make that confession, then you become a part of the church. You become a stone. You become a building block in the church that Jesus is building all over the world. The rock is the confession that Peter made. Now, here's what I believe. This is the position of Augustine and other church fathers. The rock is Jesus. There's a play on words here that that we don't see in our English translation, Peter and rock. The, The word Peter is a Greek word, Petros. The word rock is a Greek word, Petra. And they mean slightly different things. You are Peter, Jesus said. Petros is the Greek word. It means a small rock. It means a stone. And on this rock, Petra, massive boulder, a cliff of rock, a huge stone, I will build my church. Now, I wasn't standing there that day. And in fact, none of us here today were standing there that day. But, but I think that it might have gone something like this. Who do men say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks at him and says, You are Petros, small stone." pebble. And on this Petra, and I think he pointed to himself, on this Petra, this rock that is massive, this boulder, this cliff of rock, on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Jesus is simply stating that he will establish a community of followers built on himself, that Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. O.S. Hawkins relates in one of his books the last time that he took W.A. Criswell to Israel. Both of them pastor, of course, at First Baptist Dallas at one time. Listen to what O.S. Hawkins writes. The last time I took W.A. Criswell to Israel, he wanted to drive all the way north to Caesarea Philippi. He knew this would be likely his last visit to the Holy Land, which he loved so passionately. I sought to talk him out of it because of the difficulty of the journey, driving all of that way from Jerusalem, but he was undeterred. Thus we drove up north, up beyond Galilee, all the way to the foothills of Mount Hermon, to the very headwaters of the Jordan River, to the spot where Jesus took his own disciples in Matthew chapter 16. Upon arriving, we walked over and sat together on a rock under a tree. In a moment, the old white-haired pulpit warrior stood up. Without saying a word, he reached down and he picked up a small stone. He studied it carefully in his hand and said... You are Petros, a small pebble. Then he turned and looked across the river and pointed to a big rock ledge and said, And upon this Petra, rock, large solid rock, I will build my church. He confessed with Peter, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Let me show that to you. I've got a picture of it. There it is right there. That is Caesarea Philippi as it looks today. And you can see the massive cliff. If if the picture was larger, it would go all the way around here. And Caesarea Philippi is down here. And you can see it's a very rocky area. Absolutely it is. You could pick up a pebble or a stone at any time. You could pick up a rock that maybe you could hold in your hand or maybe it would take two people to pick up right there. 
You are Peter, Petros. And upon this Petra, this rocky cliff, this massive boulder, I will build my church. Now, let me show you something else that just nails down why I believe that is the interpretation of Matthew 16. Turn, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you're turning in the Pew Bible, that's, that's page 1014, 1015, those two pages. You're going to find 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want you to find verse 4. Because this really clears it up for me. Who was Jesus talking about that day? Upon whom does he build his church? Well, let's, let's let the man who heard him that day, let's let the man whom he answered that day, let's let the man who he was talking to that day describe for us who the church is built upon. 1 Peter, written by Peter, the man we just heard about in Matthew chapter 16. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 4. And you come to him a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Look at verse 6. For it says in Scripture, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, who's the cornerstone? Who's the rock that Peter is talking about that, is, that the church is built upon? Verse 4 calls it a living stone. And you come to him a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. A living stone. That's almost an absurd statement. It's a contradiction in terms. A stone is not alive. In fact, when we want to say that something is really dead, we say it is stone cold dead. But this stone is alive. Not this stone. This stone is not stone cold dead. This stone is alive. Yes, he's alive. Jesus is alive. And what is he? He is the chief cornerstone. The word there in verse 6 refers to a massive stone that in the first century would hold a building together. At great cost and care, the cornerstone would be carved out and moved and set in place. The cornerstone controlled the design of the building and it had the, held the building together. One has been found dating from the first century that was 69 feet long, 12 feet high, 13 feet wide. That's a big rock. 69 feet long, 12 feet high, 13 feet wide. Friends, Jesus is the rock, the Petra, the massive boulder, the huge stone on which the church is built. Peter knew it. The church is not built on him. It's built on Jesus, the chosen, precious cornerstone. But wait, I told you you were valuable. I'm a stone fixed on Jesus. I told you, you were precious. You were unique. You were priceless. Look at verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Look at verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's who you are. See how valuable you are? You are a stone fixed on Jesus. Do you see that? Verse 5 calls you a living stone. 
Now, remember that cornerstone? It is 69 foot long. It is 12 feet high. It is 13 feet wide. And on top of that massive stone are smaller living stones. Every Christian down through the ages. There's Peter who's on that rock. There's James. There's John. Every Christian down through the centuries. There's Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and Billy Graham and Pepper Purrier, all the big names in Christianity are there. No. On top of that massive stone, there you sit, and you sit, and you sit, and you sit. And you sit, 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 and I sit. On top of that massive stone, we all sit because we are living stones. We are a stone fixed on Jesus. I have anchored my life in Him. You have grounded your life in Jesus. He is your foundation. You are a part of a house. Get this. You are a part of a house that God is building It is called a spiritual house in this passage, and it is known as the church. And every time someone makes that confession that Peter made back in Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Every time that divine truth is revealed to a person, another stone is added to that spiritual house. Now watch this, because we're headed back to Matthew 16. Just a moment. We're headed back. Verse 5 tells us that we are a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That means you yourself have access to God. Verse 9 calls you a royal priesthood. Through Jesus Christ, you have direct access to God. You have equal access with any other believer. I don't have better access to God the Father than you do. I don't have a more direct line than you do. God doesn't have an unlisted phone number that I know and you don't. God doesn't have me in his list of contacts and not you. The word priest in the New Testament is always used to refer to believers But along with that privilege of being a holy priesthood, along with the privilege of being a royal priesthood, we have an awesome responsibility. Do you see what it says? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I said offer up because that's literally what the Greek says. It is a word used in the Old Testament of the priest in the temple. They had to walk up a four and a half foot incline to get to the altar. They literally brought the sacrifice up. They literally offered up the sacrifices. They had to walk up that four and a half foot incline to offer up those sacrifices. They would literally carry up the sacrifice to the altar. Now, you and I don't have any physical sacrifices to carry up to the altar. We carry up spiritual sacrifices. Look down in verse 9. Verse, verse 9 says that we are this chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, that we may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. There's the one vital Spiritual sacrifice that you and I have to offer up. It is the one must do spiritual sacrifice. There are others, acts of service, good deeds, yes. But here's the big one. The big spiritual sacrifice that you're to offer up. You are to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is his will for you. So let's add this to the life part. I am a stone fixed on Jesus in a house, remember? A spiritual house following his will. Now, put that in your pocket and go back to Matthew chapter 16 because I want to connect these truths that we've learned from Peter back to what Jesus said to Peter. In Matthew 16. So find your way back to Matthew chapter 16. That's on page 822 again. If you are in the Pew Bible and look at verse 19. 
after Peter has confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus has told him, you are Petra, small pebble, and on this rock, this massive rock, this massive cliff of rocks, this massive stone, I'm going to build my church. And Peter understands that the cornerstone is Jesus, and he's just a... He's just a small stone on that structure of that spiritual house that is, that is being built. And he's to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Jesus says this, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, that's how valuable you are. That's how important you are. Jesus says, I will build my church upon myself with you because you are my personal possession. I chose you. You are the object of my divine love. You are the object of my divine care. And because that is true, I am giving you the keys to the kingdom. The Lord Jesus gives us that kind of responsibility because we are priests in His kingdom. Now, what do keys do? It's not hard. It's not a trick question. What do keys do? Keys open doors and let people in. Keys lock doors and keep people out. We have the keys of the kingdom. We have the keys of the kingdom. What do keys do? They open doors and let people in. And they lock doors and keep people out. We have the keys to the kingdom and we are to use them to open the door so that people may enter the kingdom we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that others too may come out of darkness into light When did Peter first use the keys to open the kingdom and others rushed in? On the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood there that day, reached into his pocket, pulled out the keys to the kingdom, preached a sermon, and 3,000 people came through the open door as Peter took those keys to the kingdom and opened the door to the kingdom. You read the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts and Peter used those keys over and over again. He used those keys all the time. He proclaims the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Dear family, you and I have the same keys. At the end of a service on Sunday morning when we stand here and we sing what we call a decision hymn, what what am I doing? I am taking the keys to the kingdom and opening the door for you to come into the kingdom. And if you're willing to make the same confession that Peter made, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Welcome through the door, friend. You're in the kingdom. You and I have the same keys. Open the door to the kingdom by opening your mouth and telling others about Jesus. I am a stone fixed on Jesus in a house following his will. I like the story of the little boy who went to his first Sunday school class. When he came into big church, his mother asked him, Who was your teacher? What was her name? The little boy replied, I don't remember her name, but she must have been Jesus' grandmother because he's all she talked about, and she even had pictures. That's the way we are to be. Talk about Jesus. Must have been Peter's grandmother, Jesus' grandmother, because that's all she talked about. But that, that's who we've got to be. We've got to talk about Jesus all the time. We've got to use those keys. 
to open the doors. Now, we're, we're, we're about to tread off onto holy ground here for just a moment. Look at the next phrase. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's another thing that keys do. Keys symbolize authority. I have keys to this building. I, I can get in any room in this building any time I want to. I have the keys. Because I am authorized to be here. I am in a position of authority. I have the keys to this building and I can come anytime I want to because I am authorized to be in here. Keys are a symbol of authority. Now, the phrase bind and loose that you see there were common Jewish phrases that mean to forbid and to allow. To bind something is to declare it forbidden. To loose something is to declare it allowed. Now here's where we're about to step off on holy ground. We have the authority of heaven in our words and in our actions. God's sovereign initiative is worked out through His church, His people. God's sovereign initiative is worked out through you and me. We speak and people enter the kingdom of God. Think about that. We speak and people enter the kingdom of God. They do so in accordance with His sovereign will. But we also have the authority to bind the powers of hell and loose powers of heaven. We bind the enemy and his powers. We loose, we unlock the powers of heaven to combat the powers of evil that attack other people's lives. And you better be doing that. If you're not, you need to start. You have the authority to bind hell and loose heaven on your children, on your grandchildren. We can halt the enemy and turn heaven loose on our children and on our grandchildren. Are are you praying that way? Are you praying in that authority? You better be because Satan is out to destroy your children. Satan is out to destroy your grandchildren. He's out to ruin your family. And you need to be praying, Lord, bind the enemy. Keep him away. Because that's exactly what Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6 when he says, lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from the evil one." That's what he taught us to pray. Lead lead me not into temptation, Lord, and deliver us from evil. Literally, evil one. You need to be praying that. It's the authority. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's the authority you have. That's the privilege you have. That is, that is the right you have as a living stone fixed on Jesus in a house following His will. Now listen to me, sir, ma'am, student. It all starts when you answer that question that you must answer. You cannot escape. You can't get away from. It will be there tomorrow when you wake up. It will be there the next day when you wake up. It is in front of you right now. Jesus asks you 
Who do you say that I am? You got to answer. And when it, when you answer like Peter does, you're the Christ, the Messiah, my Savior, the Son of the living God, the one who is uniquely related to the Father. That's when it starts. That's when you become a stone fixed on Jesus and following His will. But, it, but if, you've, if you've already answered that way, and, and most of us in the room this morning have, most of us in the room this morning, at one time, there was a confession that we made, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. So it continues then when you, when you open your eyes to what's true about you. Let's wrap this up by talking about these simple take-home truths. When you open your eyes to what's true about you, you're valuable, you're important, you're owned by God, you are, you are His possession. And then when you open your mouth to what's true about Jesus, He's the Christ. And you tell others that. You take those keys and you open the door and you speak and others come into the kingdom through your words because you've been given the keys to the kingdom. Use them. And with those keys come authority to bind and to loose. I hope you're praying that way. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your word. I pray that it's been clear, Father. I pray, Father, that we, everybody here has an understanding of, of who they are, how valuable they are. God's own possession. But Father, I pray with that privilege that we'll see the responsibility we have. We've been handed the keys and we can't keep them in our pocket. We've got to use them because keys unlock doors. May we go this week, Father, and just unlock a whole lot of doors. as we lose heaven. Father, I pray for that one who is just right there, Father. They're at the point of stepping across that line of faith and confessing, like Peter, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. May these next moments be that time, Father, when they step across and come to faith in Christ. We'll give you glory and honor. May your spirit draw them to himself. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet and we're going to begin to sing. Just as I said a moment ago in the sermon. Got my keys here. I'm about to unlock the door. You come into the kingdom today. Come down an aisle. One of our ministers will be here. I'll be in the middle. You come. Saying, I'm confessing like Peter. You're the Christ, Jesus, the Son of the living God. If you need to come to the altar and do business with the Lord, you come. It's always open for you to do that.